Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there, Josh. How are you? Great, Christian. How are you? Good. And again with us, we have a special guest, filmmaker extraordinaire, executive producer, David Patterson. Hello, David. Hey there. So today we do not have Jason. Yeah, I just want to say we are missing Jason today. Hopefully he'll, he may pop on before we're done, but we miss you, Jason. Oh, good. Um, but we'll see if we can survive without him. Hopefully we can. Uh, but today is, it will be more of like an update, some questions about things kind of going on in the world of distribution and film festivals and deliverables and so forth. But uh, why don't we start with a film update, Christian? Sure. So this week um, has been more on the business side of things than the film side of things that I do think they are quite connected. Um, we talked last week to our new head of business operations, Hunter Taylor, who's sort of been whipping things into shape starting with me. So he's uh, looking at the business from an efficiency overview standpoint and reporting back that it isn't as efficient as it should be. So one of the very first things he has done is... Wait, are you saying an artist isn't completely efficient? <laughs> I know. I'm such an artist. I am not a detailed-oriented person. I wish you could see my lovely office. Um, but Hunter um, has suggested that we try using a new app called Todoist. And so I've now downloaded this on my phone and on my uh, computer. So far this week, I've really actually enjoyed it. It's helping me move away from all of these yellow notepads I've been addicted to forever that end up accumulating all over my office. Uh, and the great thing about it is that if I set measurable goals, like if I don't make my to-do list 30 deep and I actually pick some things I can get accomplished in one day and I get those done and checked off in my day, I level up. <laughs> And so it's such a nice incentive for me to, uh, you know, to try to be more organized. So, so far that's been helpful. He's been um, pulling the data analytics from uh, a lot of our, all of our, you know, social media websites, things like that, and trying to figure out how to organize that so we can use that data. Um, I have been working with, um, Actually, the Boston Film Festival, we talked about that, I think, in our last update. We had just gotten news that we were accepted, and I was really feeling like it was an accident, but it wasn't. We really did get in, and I still had not heard from them until late last night, and I was beginning to wonder, gosh, are they even going to be able to pull it off because there's so much that goes into getting the deliverables completed. So usually when you get into a film festival, they write you back and they say, we need all these things. Not too dissimilar from when you get distribution and they say, we need all these things. So it does take some time to get that worked out. It's different for every festival. So uh, we did finally hear last night and they gave us a list of their deliverables and we were working on those today. We were also working with the Chagrin Doc Fest. Tickets have gone on sale now for that at, I think it's chagrindocfest.org. Um, but you can Google the Chagrin Documentary Film Festival if you're wanting to meet us in Ohio or if you live in Ohio and you want to see it online. Uh, that's a great place to start. I have and, a question. Yeah. Is this the one, this is the drive-in, the Chagrin? Yeah. What time is it starting? You said 4.30? 4.30 in the afternoon on October 10th. Is that when the film starts? No, they'll have an opening announcements and, you know, okay. welcome and everything. Uh, but they're using LED screens, I guess, that you can see during the daytime. Oh, uh, that's cool. So that is kind of cool. Uh, so they're working on that. We did find out only 70 cars are allowed. So uh, if people... And members to the film festival, which I think is like $260 or something like that, are the ones that get first dibs on those. And if they have tickets left over, they can, um, you, people can buy them first come, first serve for $25 a piece. But the way that our festival rollout is going to go, um, it looks like Boston begins on September 24th. That is going to be our USA premiere, and it is going to be 
they're going to have a small in-person screening. It sounds like they're working on maybe a larger one, but for right now, there's one that seats 25 people. And then they, um, on the 25th, the Lady Filmmakers Festival starts, and it is an online festival. So you can buy a pass for the entire festival to watch all the films, or you can just pay $10 to get a ticket to watch The Girl Who Wore Freedom. And after it, they're going to have a Q&A. And on that Q&A, it's going to be me and Bill Ebel and the composer and um, Danny and Flo are going to come in from France. So that was exciting. And then um, we, that'll be on the 25th through the October 4th. And then Chagrin begins on October 6th through 11th. And, and so that's our, that's where we are right now with all of our acceptances. And how many, how many have you not heard back from? Um, probably about a hundred and ten. Now, or, and let me, I'll rephrase the question. How many of you not heard back from that? Uh, could st- you could still hear back from? A hundred and ten. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch that have been canceled that even before they let us know whether we got in or not. And so uh, what's that number? That's like eight or nine, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then of course we had talked to one of the other podcasts, several we got, did not get into. Uh, the main reason was because instead of 125 films being accepted, they took like anywhere from 15 to 20. And so I don't count those as not getting into them either because they just went teeny on us and there's not much you can do about that. So I, I have a question about that. The reason they're taking fewer films uh, is related to COVID. At the same time, aren't there fewer films being produced right now? So come next year, won't there be fewer films to be entered into film festivals? I'm going to have to uh, say yes, uh, but I'm also going to say no, if that works. Um, The simple fact is there are a lot of people just waiting this out. So say a film festival only got 1,500 uh, submissions. A lot of people just kind of backpedaled on going into the festival circuit once things started getting a little questionable. And so they just said... uh, just like the rest of the world, maybe we can wait this out. And as we sort of explained on this film festival, festivals really begin in the fall um, and then and then go into the next year. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are waiting till next spring to start applying to certain festivals. Now, if you're a big gun, then you're going to be applying for, say, Sundance in um, actually – to go to Sundance this year, it would have already been by August or September to submit. Open. Um, but uh, the simple fact is there's no lack of films to be submitted to film festivals. Um, the great thing about technology is anyone can make a movie. And the worst thing about technology is anyone can make a bad movie. So festivals are not going to any, have any lack of submissions next year. For the, for the combination of a lot of people um, just holding off on submitting films and then a lot of people going, hey, let's make a movie real fast because I guess there's not that many submissions this year and let's and we'll get in even if it's crummy because, you know, there's not that many movies. It's just not the case. It's, you know, it's kind of like the slowdown on the highway. You know, you're doing 80 miles an hour, then you're doing four miles an hour, then you're doing 80 miles an hour, then you're doing four miles an hour. And there was no construction. There was no car accidents. It's right. just what the hell's going on. And it's just the pulse of the highway. And uh, actually, it's called herd mentality, believe it or not. They talk about herd, human, herd immunity. But herd mentality is when people hit the brake and another person hits the brakes, another person hits the brakes, and the car slow down for no reason whatsoever. And then they all speed up again. So I think that's going to be the exact same thing. I'm sorry about the little divergence. Uh, But that's going to be the same thing with the film business. It is ground to a halt. And then it's going to yank forward. And then it's going to slow down again because people are like, you know, 
what are we doing? And it will slowly work its way back into a steady pace. But yeah, I think but, it's, go ahead. Sorry, David. But to, to try to interpret his submissions for the next year's festival is going to be much easier. I don't think so. Because like I said, there's going to be people who had held over on other films. In fact, we've had festivals say, hey, why don't we just hang out to your film till next year and we'll consider it for next year. Yeah, that was gonna, that, the, my point. That was my question. Yeah, why, why don't they just do that? Well, they have done that. Like, so in, I think in almost every one that basically said they weren't happening, they've said, we will keep you in consideration for our festival next year. So you could have a glut of films next year and the competition could be even harder because even if this year production is slowed down in terms of principal photography, they're not out shooting and doing things. There were a bunch in the pipeline that were in their post-production phase. And so post-production can continue moving along, you know, maybe at a little slower pace if people get sick, but there are going to be movies that are done and able to enter into the film festivals, new ones and ones like mine that are being considered over again. And that's a very valuable point she made. Um, and we've kind of discussed this is making a movie is actually a lot easier than finishing a movie. So there's tons of movies that have been sitting around for four or five years that people are probably now getting them done because there's nothing else to do. Meaning they didn't have time to get the editing because they have the waitering job or they work at a car dealership where, well, now they're home. Now they can finish the film. So you might actually see a complete opposite of a massive glut of films that had been finished in the last couple of years or shot, but just hadn't been finished and edited. But, you know, and like we talked about title clearances and such like that, that stuff you can get done during a pandemic. You know, a lot of post-production can get done without you putting a bunch of people in a room together. So, you know, the more I think about it, there might be a massive uh, submission glut next year from films that just took forever to get done. And then people said, hey, I got time on my hands to get this movie done. That's right. So you guys have a, a publicist who's working to remind us what the publicist does. So the publicist is the one that draws publicity for our film. So they write press releases, they review the copy that's on your websites and on all of your stuff. They uh, then, they are the ones that have relationships with the news media. And so hopefully when they send our press releases to the news media, they will get read. And um, in a normal year, they may go with you to a film festival and help you market the film at the film festival with giveaways or other stuff. They come up with those strategies about how to get people to see your movie. So their main job is to get people to see your movie, and they do that through different means of communication with the public. A lot of so filmmakers are like, well, I, I can do my own publicity, and, and you certainly can. But the issue is, will that news organization return your phone call? You know, if you're, you're Joe Bubba and you're, you're calling about your film, uh, they may not return Mr. Bubba's phone call. But if John Waxman from Waxman Publicity, based in Chicago, is calling about their latest uh, client, a, a fantastic film, that's, they'll probably return that call because since it is a publicist, that publicist will probably be involved with other films down the road. And you certainly don't want to tick off a publicist who may be rep representing the next Spielberg film. You, you just never know. So you, you're buying uh, entranceway into a lot of uh, pub pub publicity elements um, by having a publicist. I mean, people say, oh, that costs money. Well, yes, it costs money. <laughs> and it, it should be built into your budget from the beginning. So. Yeah. My personal, you know, experience with the Chicago market, it's about $5,000 a month for a good publicist. And you want to have one during your festival run. So, you know, build that money for your publicist into the film festival. I would say reserve $5,000 for film festival entry fees. And then there are the film festival deliverables, one of which we found out today. So typically, if we were to get into these film festivals in a normal year, 
you would have to give the film festival a file to play in a real theater. And typically, right now, those are DCP files. It's a specific file that is played on a projector in most theaters. And not everybody has the ability to make a DCP file. We had to do this before when we, we we've had to do it several times. Uh, but in particular, when we went to Normandy, and I may have told this story before, what a nightmare that was. Um, so the festival, the Boston festival asked us to send them a DCP and a Blu-ray as a backup. So I'm scrambling. Do we have a Blu-ray? No. We <laughs> okay. I should know that cause I'm a producer on the film, but uh, yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure we don't have a, a how do you Blu-ray? get a Blu-ray? Yeah. So the thing that's interesting about the Blu-ray is that, you know, they don't, nobody's really making those anymore. So the software is being, has been discontinued. And so you have to work with somebody who has the software and the computer already, usually a big company that's making a lot of those. Just anybody used to be able to make a Blu-ray disc or a DVD disc through certain programs, but nobody's selling those anymore. Yeah, just several years back, I, for a lot of my festivals, I would burn those DVDs in my basement on my computer and send them out and they played just fine. Yeah. But of course, this goes back again to us talking about technology, how it keeps changing on you. And uh, here all of a sudden they want a Blu-ray, which is old technology, but that technology isn't really around, you know, for us. Yeah, and so in our situation, in France, let's say, we were going to go over there and we were going to show the film at the D-Day Experience, which is a brand new, you know, IMAX-style theater. They wanted a DCP or a Blu-ray, just like Boston, and we made a DCP here through Premiere, and one of our team members did that. We checked it. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, they said they checked it, but I kind of don't know if they did. Um, and we took it to France, and then it didn't play. So the projector in that theater was not able to ingest it. It wasn't recognizing the file. And we had no idea what to do. We had a screening scheduled. The only other option was to buy a Blu-ray and or, or to make a Blu-ray disc. We didn't have a Blu-ray disc burner and we didn't have the software, and we had to track down somebody in France that had an old copy on their computer. They just happened to have it, and we ended up making one. So um, in this situation, we are going to have to find a company that is willing to make, you know, one, two, five Blu-ray discs for us quickly, and then with the DCP, we are working with a company out of Nashville that will make a DCP file. And I just talked with them, so I can give you some numbers, actually. Um, for It's a 4K film at 89 minutes. It will cost us, with a five-day turnaround time, $784. With a three-day turnaround time, $890. And then what happens is they take that file and they put it on a special drive that that company will then send to the theater. And then the theater will send the special drive back to the DCP provider. And of course, you're charged for the rental of that drive and you're charged for all the shipping services. So for us, it's probably going to end up being 800 to 850 dollars just to get boston a dcp file on time so another big cost another deliverable due and that's just something you need to we had to think about this in the beginning you know because if we get into film festivals overseas they're going to ask they will have different um requirements requirements and so yeah it's it's just you have to think about all of these things when you enter the film festivals do i have money to make and ship all those dcps now once we make this dcp file the first time that's the hardest part and then it the most expensive part we will still have to have it shipped out to different theaters and stuff like that but um we shouldn't have to have individual files of this film this version of the film made Christian, did I tell you my story when I interviewed for Big Idea Veggie Tales? 
I tell me now because I it's they they this is when they had uh but before I got on board they had a a screening of the Larry Boy down in Orlando I think it was at Universal Studios or something and it was this big deal of course and uh the night before the screening I mean you know VeggieTales fans this is when VeggieTales is huge and people are you know lining up to come see this and what was they your didn't job? have well I didn't have a job yet I I was uh, interviewing. You were interviewed. So I was interviewing for a job. I didn't know about the screening. I didn't know anything about technology and, and, and anything back then. And, and the guy interviewed me said, he was proposing this question as if it was a hypothetical. What I didn't know was this is a real, qu this, this really happened, which was, hey, we got a film festival or a screening. It's down in Florida. Uh, we finally get whatever they use back then. Beta, I have no idea. Uh, it's all copied, and uh, but UPS is closed, so we can't overnight it. How do we get our film to Orlando from Chicago in less than 24 hours? And I had no idea. I'm like, I, am I am I not going to get the job because I I don't know how mail works. You know, I don't understand this technology. I'm, I want to be a production assistant so I can learn this stuff. As it turns out. They just gave it to Phil Vischer, who got on a plane the next morning and just flew it down. He just carried it in his briefcase and carried it down there. And I, I just remember, I'll never forget, because I was sweating bullets, like, I have no idea. How, how do you? But anyway, this you problem know, is eternal. It, Trying it, to get. Yeah, it reminds me. I'm thinking back. Your story reminded me in 1980, I would say 82, 83, 84. I was working on Capitol Hill. We would interview senators for, and we would have to get something to the news and it would have to be at a certain time. We would interview them on VHS tape and then we would have to take the VHS tape and, and upload it to the bird. Now I was just a young intern at this time, but it was basically like a satellite thing somewhere that it, you know, went somewhere to New York or somewhere to somewhere else. But it was, it, I can remember them talking about this and we had to make this deadline. And it was just this technology even back then that I couldn't even understand. And here we are 30 years later and we're still dealing with these technology issues and time deadlines it's, and problems. It's not any better. It's not yeah, any We better. know studios still do that. Um, for some of the larger festivals like Venice and all the Berlin, whatever, is they send a guy, you know, and it's like one of those nuclear football situations where basically the guy has a move, has the movie in the briefcase with the hang, you know, the handcuffs on it because, you know, c copyright and theft is so big on big, big budget movies that they have a guy that basically he hang, he takes the airplane, he has the movie, he goes to set up, see if they can run it, everything. Then they give it back to him and he basically brings it down the night of the premiere and then he shows it, but does not let it go out of his sight because again, it can go missing and all of a sudden it ends up on a, you know, a Chinese website. So, you know, they're very protective, especially the big studios about things like that. That's yeah. a lot of stress. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of stress. No, it's stress for the dude that's carrying the movie, I think. <laughs> Everyone else doesn't really care, but the dude with the handcuffed <laughs> briefcase, you know, he knows if he screws up, uh, yeah, he's going to be it can starts with a sh. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> so what's what's up with distribution? Any updates with uh, getting closer to signing a deal? Well, we um, we did just recently get back um, you know a document from our lawyer that's kind of that's been amended with the things that we would feel most comfortable with in signing a deal and we're our team is reviewing that so everybody has you know got to take time to make sure that's exactly what we say uh, and then we'll send that back to this company that we're talking with and we'll the negotiations will continue I'm not sure how many you know I don't think we expect them to be like perfect we'll sign your deal uh, so my guess is we've got some more negotiating ahead of us but, you know, shopping for the distributor is a lot like marriage. I mean, you sit back after looking at it for a while, you go, could I do better? You know, and, and so that's, that's the thing. You know, here we've been going back to negotiations, negotiations, and, and, and Kish and I talk about this. You know, 
the contract's really getting good. It's really what we wanted, but can we do better? You know, and, and it's just one of those things. And of course, in some marriages, actually you can't do better and you get divorced and then you're freaking miserable. So it's one of those things like, do we continue to try to date or, or, you know, do we sign the dotted line? And, and I think I, I'm being honest that we're there. Right. And we can share that, that we're, we're getting very close to signing, but can we do better? I don't know. You know, it's just, and that's, I, we've discussed this on some of the other podcasts. This is one of the most stressful and challenging things because you're trying to decide whether to march down the aisle with, with, you know, that person who you're going to be with for the lifespan of, of at least the next three or four years with yeah. that movie. Isn't, isn't this the only company you've dated so far? No, it's. We flirted with two others. Yeah. Okay. But this is the only one we've dated. True. And, okay. And, and, and some heavy petting was involved too. So, I mean, oh we goodness. really, you know, this one we've, you know. It's, yeah, keep this PG-13. Keep it PG-13. Well, Yeah. People are going to think we're talking about cats. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> not the bad movie, by the way. But no, the point is that, and this is a business, because I, I, I talked to Christian about this. Like, you don't, you feel guilty if you've been dating these, this, this company for so long and then decide not to do it. But again, it, it really goes back to the idea of a relationship. Do you want this relationship to go to the next level? And what that means for you and, and intentions, your, your film. And it's, it's a big decision. It's a big jump. And so you always have that, you know, itch in the back of your head going, well, should I continue to look around? So, Well, and truthfully, some of the film festivals that we have entered have distribution as a prize, you know, guaranteed distribution as a prize. So then you wonder, well, gee, if we win, then what do we, then what do we do? You know, with the deal we got with that company that may be bigger, be better. So at some point we're going to have to make a decision. And I think that we will know um, if this particular company was to take the deal that we have laid out in this contract, I think I would feel comfortable with it, uh, but we'll see. So that's still hanging out there and we'll know more, I think in the next few weeks. Well, as we wrap up, I want to introduce this, this topic. Um, you've forwarded a, a bunch of documents for me to sign. Um, I had forgotten I was on this non-for-profit board. It, was, it, it feels like an eternity ago. Everything's eternity ago, pre COVID in my mind. Um, we talked about this. There is a non-for-profit called living stories can you just introduce that and we'll talk more about it on the next podcast, Christian? Yeah, for sure. Um, that paperwork that you got was the paperwork to finalize the nonprofit that we are setting up called Living Stories. And we, um, we can talk about that much, you know, a, a little more next week. I do think that it's something that all production companies might want to think about. Uh, simply if you're, especially if you're doing films with donations like our film. So um, we can talk more in detail about that, what the process has been, how I'll tell you why it's been such an eternity and why I think it's a good idea. Okay, well, I signed it, so I have no idea what I signed, so hopefully I'm good. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> you'll send that back to me and I'll check it out. It's sent, so. All right. All right, well, anything else before we wrap up, David or Christian? Well, I, nope. I mean, I do. Um, the one thing that I did want to say, if you're listening to this and you're interested in a blog editor position, we are looking to bring somebody on board who uh, would be willing to oversee our blog. Um, we used guest bloggers as writers, but we need an editor that helps facilitate all of that and keeps our blog going. So write me at Christian at NormandyStories.com if you're interested in applying for that job. Otherwise, if you can make a donation, we're still really strapped for cash, especially now that we have to have a DCP made. So we'd appreciate any donations and you can watch. I would love it if you would go and subscribe to our YouTube page. We're trying to raise our numbers there. I think we only, we don't even have 200 subscribers to our YouTube page uh, and we're posting new content up there all the time. So go subscribe to us on YouTube, make a donation if you can. And if you're interested in becoming a blog editor, shoot me an email. 
All right. Well, David, Christian, thank you. And to our audience, thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody. Take care. Have a good week.